Hey everyone, this is Adam Brown and this is Consumer Packaged. This is bonus episode two and I welcome my first founder guest, Alex Bayer of Genius Juice. Full disclosure, Alex is a former client and I invested in his WeFunder campaign afterward as I'm a big believer in his mission and his products. Not only that, but I'm a big fan of Alex personally as he is one of the smartest and most thoughtful and strategic founders I have met in the game. Just like me, Alex comes from a background in sales, and I have found that many of the best founders and CEOs I have come across over-index in sales skills. So much of leading a company is selling customers, investors, and even your team members on the dream and mission. If you genuinely believe in that mission, as Alex does, and you have the ability to articulate it well, then you can make great things happen. At the end of the day, a founder believes their baby is the cutest, but they need to make you think it is too. Understanding sociology, my major at the University of Michigan, by the way, is what and what makes people tick is so important in sales and in running a consumer facing brand. I feel that Alex and Genius Juice are winners and I think you will too. Sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Welcome Alex, it's really good to have you. Hey Adam, thanks for having me on the program. Excited to be here. Great, so playing into that observation around sales, I love that you were working at a desk job in sales and not really destined for this life. So here you are, tell us a little bit about that journey. Uh, wow, uh, where do I start? I mean, uh, straight out of college, I went into an insurance job. So I started working at Aflac and um, I really uh, didn't know what to expect, but I think the main thing, I know my cats are gonna be going everywhere behind me here, um, the life of having uh, Zoom calls at home. So um, it'll be extra, much more entertaining than me. So um, I really just wanted to get into sales and really get my feet wet and um, learn how to uh, get out there, talk to people, put myself into a, an uncomfortable position, right? And really just push myself further. So I was really introverted um, in college. So going, getting out of college, I wanted to do something to get, get, you know, get out of my shell. So um, I started selling just, you know, insurance, um, approach companies. And what, what was really cool about it was I was connecting with CEOs, CFOs, um, VPs, getting to the decision maker and getting to people that were that high up, I really learned a lot from them and learned uh, the selling process and um, move him a little bit. And so, uh, so yeah, so from doing that, I learned how to speak that language, the C-level language. Um, so I did insurance for about seven years. And then after that, I decided to open up a, uh, my own company. I said, you know what? I can only sell accident and cancer policies for so long and repeat the same things over and over and over again. Um, I learned a lot from it, learned how to sell. I sat down with thousands of people, uh, all different walks of life from county employees to C levels. And then I'm like, you know what, I'm going to jump into something that I want to control and something that I can, I can grow from the ground up. So I started a nonprofit company um, called karaoke for a cure. And I did that in 2000 and, 2011, and I ran that for about two years, raised over $100,000 for children's hospitals in Atlanta and LA. And um, that really taught me on how to build a team. You know, I built a team of about 25 volunteers. Um, I had people that um, were helping me run events, to raise money, and um, it was fun, but it was also not profitable. Um, I actually, I think I, I barely paid myself anything. It was really a labor of love. And, uh, but I, I learned how to, I learned about team building. I learned about how to, I think what I learned there was getting a team together for a common purpose and a common goal um, and drove everyone in the same direction and inspired people. So that was fun too. And then around 2013, I um, decided I'm going to exit the nonprofit world and go into something that is hard to be profitable in, but you can be, which is food and beverage. And uh, I created Genius Juice in 2014. And that was really from, I guess, the, the I'll conclude it, my story with this, that when I was in insurance, um, and also even my nonprofit, every morning I made a smoothie. And I always felt like there was no smoothie on the market that 
really was satisfying, that was filling and also clean. Everything had too much sugar in it and it was not really um, satiating. So um, every morning I just made a very simple almond milk smoothie. And um, I loved it. I love the concept of drinking smoothies in the morning, something light, gives me energy, you know, pushes me, gets me, uh, you know, catapults me into the day. And from there I said, you know what, I need to create, you know, uh, my own healthy smoothie. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I discovered it from a friend of mine who um, just basically cracked open a coconut, took the water and the meat and blended it. And I'm like, that is genius, whole coconut. I want to create that. And that's how I got into Genius Juice. So I, I love that background story, right? Like a lot of these stories that you hear just when you meet people, I meet founders daily. Um, and a lot of these podcasts, they started that eureka moment. I love the, the precursor, right? Like you had such a crash course in sales, which is a humbling experience, especially when you're selling products like you were selling at Aflac, right? It's not the sexiest product. It's usually around a heavy topic. You, you are an introvert by nature. You identified your weak hand. And I always tell uh, clients of mine, I tell employees of mine, you can be really strong at something and you should double down on that. But you also have to work your weak hand. Or I say like, if you're a righty, you got to work your left foot if you want to be a pro soccer player, um, if you want to be at that next level. And so identifying that at an early age and putting yourself into that position, like jumping into fear, um, you're like a trailblazer and a pioneer because that's like in vogue now. And that wasn't then. Now it's face your fear and you hear Will Smith talking about it every day and Jay Shetty and all these people with podcasts. Um, it really says a lot about you. And from my experience working with you, very, um, very on brand for you as a person to identify that at an early age and lean into it. Uh, and then to go into a business where there's a uh, good that comes from it, but very little income. Uh, that's a humbling experience, but you banked a uh, team building experience. So, um, you know, for founders out there, especially young founders, I find in their early twenties, um, you know, that are jumping into this, it's very in vogue to have a keto product or a savory product or the 17th almond milk on the, on the market. Um, it is so hard to run a business. So you have to have these foundations above and beyond the dream and the passion of whatever that product is without those foundations. Uh, it's going to be very hard to survive. Uh, especially right now in a market like this. We've had a really positive market for quite some time. In the tough market, you got to have those foundations, uh, be a wartime general to be able to understand how to work with people to get through the hardship. So um, I really appreciate that. And I think our listeners will as well. Uh, my next question on the Genius Juice product is that um, whenever I find a product that's like so simple and so straightforward, um, like why, why is it different? Like why doesn't the big player, why don't the big players just do it themselves? Uh, I'm sure they will. Um, it's, it's what I, what I've learned in the beverage industry, our food and beverage is that normally the big, the big guys, you know, whether it's a Coke, Pepsi, or, you know, someone, a larger coconut brand, they usually don't touch it until it has, um, significant proof of concept, like not even the beyond proof of concept where you're in, thousands of stores and doing millions upon millions in revenue. Um, that might be, that wouldn't be my assumption as part of that. Um, the other side is that our product is not typically easy to make. Um, I don't think that's the biggest part of it, but it's not like we're putting in water with powders, you know, like other brands that are competing with us. There's a lot of other brands that literally are just 90% filtered water. And then they put in protein powder or they put in, you know, superfood powders, nothing against those brands, not knocking our competitors, but ours is, we, we have literally a vertically integrated full facility in Thailand where we crack open the coconuts, you know, and we have a, our partner has this facility. They've owned it for years, millions of dollars have gone into the, the technology and the sourcing and, you know, all this pri proprietary technology, I should say. And that is not an overnight project. I mean, it took years to scale that, to be able to keep up with our demand and our distribution and supply chain. So I think that the barrier to entry is what I'm getting at is one area which makes it hard for just anyone to come in to make this product. Um, it's not only about making it, it's about sourcing it at the right price, having the access to the farms, 
having the supply chain and also the technology. So it took, I mean, it only took me three years to figure it out. It's nothing, just three years. So that's why we couldn't really scale in the first few years. It was just figuring it out, right? And, and, and then once we dialed in the model process, then we started scaling, you know, in 2018. So um, that's part of it. But I, I think the bigger reason, which is what I talked about before, is companies like Coke or Pepsi, they don't really acknowledge a trend until it's sizable. And then they go in. And honestly, it's not a bad thing. Like, I'm not afraid of that. You know, it's funny, like I spoke to um, my buddy, you know, Justin Gold, right, for Justin's peanut butter, and which they've since sold to um, Hormel, right? I think Hormel, they sold to Hormel. But, you know, I asked him, what did you think when all these other competitors came in and started doing, you know, almond butter with, you know, um, with maple syrup and or peanut butter with chocolate and like, they, they started copying you. They made, the, they made the squeeze packs, they copied you. He's like, that's probably one of the best things that could have happened to us because it propelled the entire category. You know, having a, um, a behemoth coming in with a similar product is like the rising tide that will lift all the boats and bring more awareness to the category and bring more marketing and get more people to actually buy the products. You see the same thing in kombucha, right? When Health Aid came in to compete with GT, GT sales went up, they didn't go down, right? You know, when Vive came in for the wellness shots, all the other competitors in the wellness shot category, they went up like crazy, you know? They should have probably said a, sent a thank you letter to Vive saying thank you for coming in. So it's not a bad thing to have competition and I actually welcome it because it will help lift the category and um, bring more awareness to what it is. And one other thing I'll mention too is we are in, what's unique about our product is and what what my goal was not to cre recreate the wheel my goal was just to make the wheel sexier and you know and turn faster so within an existing very saturated category which is coconut water and other types of plant-based beverages we created something new within that category being whole coconut having the water and the meat and being more of a smoothie um, so we innovated the coconut water category significantly, right? By using the whole coconut, which no one has ever done before. But I also think we innovated the plant-based category because up until we came out, there was only, um, like I mentioned, uh, products that were mostly water with protein powder in it and other superfood powders. And that to me is kind of watering down a product. Um, our product does not contain water, it's whole coconut. So it's literally one of the cleanest, simplest, and most fulfilling plant-based beverages you can find on the market today. So we're kind of innovating in those two spaces, the coconut water, plus also the plant-based, which is really where we're heading in the category, right? We're more plant-based. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's really our innovation. Yeah, I love it. I think I think playing on a on a really good trend. You know, when I started working with you, I, I explained. I said I have this new client. Here's what they do. And uh, a friend of mine said, "Oh, all those coconut waters. It's all BS. They're all water." And I said, "Exactly. Why we're working with this client? It's the alternative. It's it's going to fix that problem because you know that you want coconut water, but you read somewhere. Here's what all the big players are doing to it. So you've written it off. This is the solve for that. And I turned them on to your your product, and they really liked it. Um, so that's the thing is like these trends happen, then they sort of level set. Sometimes the big players, even when they take a brand that might've been good and pure, they, they mass produce it and maybe degrade it. And so, uh, you know, it's hard to stay the course and make the product, spend the years, put in the time, put in the effort and get there, which is not something Coke, Pepsi and Dr. Pepper want to do. Um, and it's not so easy. You have to fund it. There's opportunity cost there's life, there's all these things that come in the way. So by being able to like, to like run through the wave and actually get out past the break and like be able to get into a swim, puts you in a really good position and a head start. Um, and uh, and uh, it's exciting to see as it grows. And I would imagine it would start to now really double down and accelerate like a snowball. So I think that's what you're probably starting to see, which is great. Um, just on the name, and I know, you, I know you're super on brand, it's genius, it's genius idea, and I love all the marketing and stuff you do. Have you ever considered changing your name? Um, and if so, why? And if not, why? Uh, yeah, and one thing I wanted to add um, before I answer your question that you said is that I think your team 
did a really great job on really emphasizing how we are different from coconut water, right? That was one main project that when I was working with um, the, you know, the project coordinator and then also with Sarah, like we were like, the, you, got, you guys did a lot of animation videos and stop motion and really showing it's not just the water, it's also the meat from the coconut. Um, but one thing I'll mention on that, just I really wanted to touch on just for any, especially people that are pitching buyers, right? And, and really trying to get their product in and showing uh, differentiation or value add is that we we pivoted our conversation and I think it's important to do that and know what buyers are really looking for you know and adding value to their set we when we first started pitching genius it came across as just like a better version of coconut water which is part of it but what buyers are looking for now is more of like the plant-based options you know and so we shifted our conversation and that's an important point to make is like, instead of saying we're better than coconut water, you know, we're in the coconut water set. We wanted to get out of the coconut water set because like besides harmless harvest, which is at 4.99, most coconut waters are in a can and they're like a dollar 99 or 2.99 or they're in a box, you know, and they're 2.99. They're just, they're not as premium, right? They're more mainstream, more mass produced. And I didn't want to be a premium whole coconut drink that's freshly May, it's made from cracking open coconuts in our facility. I didn't want to be lumped into that category. So we got out of that category and said, we're, we're in the plant-based premium functional smoothie set. That's where we belong. So I wanted to mention that because people that might be listening or watching this, you have to find what a, what a buyer is really looking for and where you can add value to their set and speaking their language, right? The love language. Um, so getting into your question back to the um, why genius, I think it, it was kind of a double entendre. Um, I, when I first tried a whole coconut in a, in a bot, in a, in a glass, it was pre blended. It was blended by one of my friends put into a glass. I tried it. She cracked open the coconut right in front of me. I tried it and said, this is absolute genius. This idea of having whole coconut, that was the origination like the original, original origination of Genius Juice. However, what it's really morphed into is that people, consumers, are looking for functionality in beverages. What is it gonna do to me? You know, this is why Vital Proteins sold for so much, collagen, right? What does collagen do for me? You know, it's not, people are not drinking collagen for the taste. Uh, what does it do for me? So having the coconut meat in our product um, it has functionality for the brain. And a lot of people don't put the two and two together. Some people do, most people don't. That the good fats, or the fats I should say, and the MCTs that are in the coconut meat actually help with brain function. They support brain function and cognitive ability. So it's a brain food. Like it's like having avocado or nut or you know, any kind of nut butter. It's full with fats and it's gonna have also MCTs, coconut meat, and that will boost brain function, hence the name genius. So that's, that's kind of the, uh, the play on the, the, the ingredient to really tie in and really streamline the ingredients, functionality, and the branding all in one swoop. Um, I like it and it's very well articulated and it's uh, again, I think it goes back to this thread of sales Like even when I called my company circle media um, There's a you know, it's media. There's a zillion names out there, but a lot of people don't understand it They actually think it's a bad name because it's spelled wrong. It's SIR like why'd you do that? The salesman in me thinks I want the opportunity for the at bat to explain the narrative and I think with genius juice It's the same thing. I see it. I see it on the bottle. I love the I love the um, illustration and I get it, but it, it begs the question for them to maybe look at it and investigate why, as opposed to the zillion of other sort of brands out there with sort of catchy names. Um, and I think that's actually a strategic sales and branding play and not a missed opportunity. Branders might disagree with me, um, but uh, that's a conversation I always like to have. And uh, I'm a fan of the name. So I was curious if you guys ever thought about changing it uh, and why you did or did not. Um, and it sounds like it was a eureka moment for you. It made a lot of sense and you're playing into the functionality from the jump uh, as opposed to later uh, figuring out like that's what stood out. So that gives you another um, advantage. I love that. Um, exactly. 
Yeah, we just, you know, I think it's, and it's also something that I think is catchy, you know, like genius juice, like something that's easy to remember. Um, like your name is easy to remember, you know, your company circle, doesn't matter if it's spelled right, wrong, it's unique and no one else really is using that. So it's, it's, it's standing out in any way that you possibly can from competitors. So that, that's right. That's right. Um, so I just wanted to talk about Shark Tank. I know you've answered a lot of questions. I know a lot of people have seen you. I think you guys have run maybe like two or three times now on Shark Tank with the air, uh, additional airings. Had a lot of experience. Uh, Bombas, I'm wearing Bombas socks and sweatpants right now. One of my favorite all-time clients. I think that was Damon John's best deal ever. Um, it was yeah. really exciting uh, knowing about it. And I'm just curious, like, um, was any like surprising nugget of the Shark Tank experience for you? Anything incredibly harder than you thought? Anything much easier than you thought? Like what's one nugget you would share? If somebody was listening, just curious as a fan or like about to go down that rabbit hole. What would you say stood out as anything like just like on one end or the other that, that stood out as very interesting to you? Well, I mean, with the, I mean, with the experience of actually being on the show. Yep. Um, I think it was interesting where um, it, it took a lot of work to actually get on the show. I mean, that's, that's the part that surprised me. I think the most is like the amount of paperwork and that just to like, and then also applying like, you know, uh, auditioning and then re and then, you know, there's, there was probably three or four different hurdles to get through just to like even get to the show. Um, but I think being on the show, like what, what I experienced was I thought I was going to be much more nervous, like on the show. Cause I've seen so many entrepreneurs like totally blow it, <laughs> you know, like they just get nervous under the lights and they, they kind of freeze up. And so going into it, I really promised myself to just be myself, you know, like not try to impress, you know, I want to impress them, but not to try, not to try to be someone else just because I'm on a television show because I'm in front of, you know, millionaires and billionaires. Like, I'm like, I'm just going to bet on myself and be myself and let my, my true personality shine through in front of them. And when I did that, it actually paid off big time, you know, like, even, even like my friends that watched, you know, cause we had a, we had a viewing party, you know, and we had like 25 people there. They're like, Oh, you're, you're acting just like if you were talking to me, you know, like that's how you act when you talk to me, like at a coffee shop, you know, that's how you would talk about genius juice and about how, you know, your excitement and passion for it. So I, I learned a really valuable life lesson is like, no matter how much is on the line or if it's a high stakes moment, or every, or just everyday life, like on the Zoom call right now, I'm talking to you like I would talk to Mark Cuban, you know. So maybe we, it's our next future billionaire right here. Yeah, I hope. Uh, yeah, that I just be myself. Um, you know, treat everyone as an equal, no matter who you're talking to, and just be passionate, be excited, and um, be transparent. And I did all that on the show, and that my personality sh uh, shine through, and. What's also cool is not only did we get a deal on the air, that deal eventually fell through, just to be in all transparency. Most deals fall through on Shark Tank, like 80% of them, even if the deal was made on the show. But who I really connected with beyond just the people on the show were the viewers. And they felt that. They, they, they wanted to try the product, buy the product. Um, and we, we did a quarter million in sales online um, in about two weeks from Shark Tank, you know, from Amazon and from GeniusJuice.com. And to get that level of sales, that means you have to connect with the viewers. They have to like you, respect what you're doing, trust you, right? That you're not trying to pull one over or mislead anyone, but also really fall in love with the concept of the product where they're like, I really want to try this. And I mean, our sales were a joke. Our online sales were a joke before Shark Tank aired. I think we did like $3,000 a month online. So we did more in one hour than the entire 2019 <laughs> after Shark Tank aired in early 2020. So it was, really, it was really cool to see that and really see how viewers really connected with me and the product and trusted me and bought the product. So it was cool. And do you see the pop on additional airings also? We definitely do, but definitely it will never match the initial pop. That never, yeah. In. But we did get re-aired in March, and our sales were about a fourth 
of what the initial airing was. Because you also have people that already saw it and they're just totally. re-watching it and, you know, and I'm waiting for an extra airing, but who knows when that will happen. I think they're, they're actually taping season 12, like right now. So yeah. I, I wasn't even sure if they'd have a season 12 because of COVID. Yeah. Like how do they do the taping, you know, and all the, you know, all the production staff, everyone's close together, all the office staff, a, a tremendous amount of people go into the planning of the show. But um, I heard that they're taping it and um, they're going to be airing it this year. So they're going to pull it off. Yeah. Um, and on the deal side, uh, yeah, you know, there was a while where I would just watch and I would just reach out to every brand afterwards. Like that was my sales Thanks. funnel. And so it. many after they're like, yeah, it didn't happen. But, you know, now we're thinking about this. It's people don't realize it's 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 almost like American Idol, right? Like you have to go and stand in line and interview and then get and then get called back and can you even leave your business and have the ability to go and wait again to then get on and then they shoot a lot you might not make it on then you make it on you might make a deal you might not it's like it's it's a it's a real real battle um to try to get there but uh really happy for you guys on the experience um and that it's propelled the business and that it's really stuck with people because that really does say a lot uh and that you had that um forum to be able to talk about it because that's sometimes everything right can i get the ad back and if I got the at bat, will I be great under pressure, which I definitely think you are. And then will people care and will it resonate? And it did. So that must have been really rewarding for you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that, Adam. Awesome. Um, so uh, pivoting, uh, what is just one of the dumbest or worst things you think you've done along the way? Um, I think the absolute dumbest thing that I um, ever did was get in the food and beverage industry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, I think the one thing we did is we had some production and supply chain challenges in 2000. And I, I mentioned this actually on Shark Tank where we um, unfortunately lost our, you know, our production or our co-packer, you know, there, you know, we just, we were making it somewhere, uh, you know, and, there, and it went a different direction, the relationship and they were no longer making it for us. And because of that, um, we had nowhere to make the product, you know? And so um, we were out of stock out of production, no supply. So I decided to pivot to a uh, to another type of product because I'm like, we can't make this whole coconut smoothie right now. What else can we do? And I pivoted to a whole other formula. And it was kind of like releasing, you know, when Coke released the new Coke, you know, even though we weren't nearly as big, we released the new Coke, the new formulation, which was a kind of a superfood type smoothie. And I was thinking like, I, I underestimated consumers, you know, and thinking they would just go right along with it because it still says genius, right? You know, it's the same bottle, same logo, but it's just a newer formula, um, tastes different, but it's still a smoothie, but I'm sure they'll like it, right? Because it's still a smoothie, it tastes reasonably good, not great. And it totally just tanked. No one was buying it. They would try it and say, this is not, this is not what I had before. I mean, people were getting upset. They were like yelling at me and emailing me and calling us. You know, I did it for a reason because I rather would have been on the shelf than off the shelf. I wanted to create something, but it was not, it was not our formula. It was not the product that people fell in love with that launched our company and made it put our company on the map. So what I learned is if you don't know what to do, do nothing. <laughs> You know, just because you don't know what to do, you don't have to actually do something to try to compensate for not knowing what to do. And that's what we did. We said, I'd rather do something than do nothing. And I learned in that moment, sometimes it's better to, to, to kind of take a step back, reflect on, on, on your surroundings and think through what your next steps are. And if you're out of the game for two months, three months, six months, that's okay. The game's always waiting for you. It's always gonna be there. When you, when you get back in the game, it will be there waiting for you. But it's good to come to the game with the right game plan. I keep on using the word game, but you know, having the right plan, having the right strategy to make sure that you're successful. Because what, what I've seen entrepreneurs misstep on, which I misstep on, is you rush into staying, you stay in action and you rush into that and you end up pushing yourself back and delaying yourself even more by making the wrong choice and setting yourself back, you know, a year or two years. And instead of even did nothing, you would have been set back three months or six months. 
So that, that was a big, that was a big lesson I learned. That's an incredible, incredible lesson. And I'm definitely going to pull that for our, our listeners and viewers. Um, I always say the worst decision is indecision. And so that makes people think like, oh, then you gotta, you gotta, you gotta just jump into something because you have to take action. That's not what I mean. I think indecision, like sitting in the middle of the tennis court like this is not great. Thinking though is, is action, right? Like, let me be strategic here and play the odds of what would work and what that might do and what impact that might have. Um, I love podcasts like this and things like this, so they can maybe learn from someone like you that might, they might not know, but get mentor, you know, sound bites from to say, oh, that was, that was a decision that someone else did. Here's what, here's the aftermath. So that plays into that is an outcome that could happen as opposed to just like winging it and figuring it out. There's just so much access to stuff that wasn't there 20 years ago that you can like learn uh, in the weeds of what might work and what might not. Um, but some soul searching and thinking is really important and just levering it back to, does this play into my original goal? And my original intent and goal was not necessarily to do a new SKU or a new product line. It, it, it was like, it seemed right, but now I learned, I've, I took a step back and, and potentially, uh, it doesn't sound like long-term it did, but in the short term, alienate a consumer that's saying, this is not what I bargained for. And then that could that pull down the whole house? And so that can be a risky proposition for a brand it's something that they should really think about. So that's really, really helpful. Um, and I think, you know, also um, being, being focused on the intent of the goal, this is a really good time during COVID to be thinking about things. Um, I'm taking this class right now from Morning Brew, this indistractable class in Nira Yal about not being distracted and learning how to understand triggers and stuff. And I'm not gonna bore anyone to tears with this. You should check that out if, if, if you're interested and I'll put it in the show notes. But, you know, gamifying, you mentioned game a bunch. This, a really good way to go about this hard business is to gamify it, play a game with it, challenge yourself, um, you know, try to win the game and not by taking other people down, but by putting points up on the board and winning in the areas that you know that you can win in. Um, and when you have a good product and a good mission uh, and you're doing something, that's why I really love the better for you space, uh, which is what you're in. Um, and you stay that course, the truth I think prevails. Um, and so if you have a good jockey and a good horse, and you have the ability to stay the course in a time like this with smart thinking, um, that's where real winners are gonna come out. And I think, I do believe you're gonna be one of them. So uh, great, great, that was a great piece. Uh, so I appreciate you sharing that with me um, and with the audience. Thank Is you. Is there anything in the business that was easier than you anticipated? Easier? Um, I don't know. I'm not, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, to kind of stroke my own ego a little bit is um, I didn't think the product would sell as well as it is selling like sales has never been really the issue for our product. I thought it would have taken longer for people to adopt it, you know, because it is different, right? Whole coconut. It's, it's, it's a different concept within a very, very um, likable and, and, and known industry, which is coconut water and also plant-based. But I think, what you know i was i was praying that you know because all you know when you, when you put a bet on something like a product you're like hopefully people like this product as much as i like it you know <laughs> and people see the value in it like i saw the value to actually you know birth it create it and put it onto the shelf and um what was surprising is that the original especially you know our original skew the whole coconut is coconut water coconut meat plain did way better than I could imagine, you know, like we had several different flavors and of all those flavors, when we came out, the original did by far the best. And we ended up cutting most of those flavors out and sticking with just the original for three years before we came out with the mocha. And now we have, you know, other flavors. So it surprised me how easily the original sold and how it was really our, you know, our workhorse and our, and our flagship products. Um, but that people also understood it and adopted it quickly. And I think that's really um, tipping the hat to the branding, you know, to our branding house, to, you know, a shout out to Fruition, our, our design company that created a great label for us and the logo and the head. And we had our original designer, Hollis, who came up with, you know, with the head, Hollis Henning design. And so I think great branding, really, really stuck through and shine through to the consumer to see it on the shelf. And then the product quality um, kept consumers coming back to buy it again and again and again. So it's a twofold process, right? The branding has to get them in 
can draw someone into buying it with a value proposition and fun branding and personality. And then the product quality has to keep that person in to buying it again and again and again. So I think that, that surprised me most that the original just kicks so much ass and is also doing very well in conventional. That, that also made, was easier than I thought. Like when we went to Albertsons Vons, our original, I pulled spins data. So I'm gonna mention a competitor here, but our originals outsells the top skew for Rebel across Albertsons Vons and is very close to Koya, the original. So the fact that it does so well in the mainstream was also a, uh, a big surprise. I thought it would do good, but not, not this good. So it's, yeah, it's good to see that. Uh, again, great nugget. You know, a lot of brands spend a lot of time on branding for an okay product. And then a lot of brands have a pretty good hero and then really bad branding and not very memorable. Um, and so like, you know, flying that plane in the wind of getting both of those right, it's not always easy. It's expensive sometimes to get branding. I uh, love the fruition team. I actually spoke to them last week. We were talking about cool. you. We're both big fans of you. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and then having that hero product. And, you know, Ithaca Hummus is one of our clients. And same deal, like, love their products. I love all of them. I have every flavor in my fridge. But that OG, the, the original classic hummus, you, you know, you wouldn't think. But it crushes. Because it's kind of like, it's right down the middle. People get it. It's, it tastes different than they've had before. And, and while I think some of the other flavors are great to have and will get other people interested, um, if you have that great hero straight down the middle, if you're able to throw that fastball right down the middle where you want it with that hero product, um, you're really onto something. So that's, that's great feedback. Um, I'm curious, um, what's one CPG or beverage brand other than you own that you love and why? Um, so it could be anything, food, beverage, doesn't matter. I'd say better for you, CPG or beverage. Okay. Um, you know, I, I really like, well, there's, there's, um, I, I really like refrigerated bars. I've really gotten into refrigerated bars because the bar industry has been very boring for the, like the last 15 years. I mean, ever after Cliff Bar, it's, it seems like, you know, Laura Bar, everything just kind of copied them right really? have dates and cashews and almonds so I, I when when the refrigerated bar industry started growing i really started getting into that i started with perfect bar but i really i really like um bright bar you know my friend uh, brandon created bright bar and he created a high protein low sugar or medium sugar not as much sugar as competitors uh nut butter bar with like superfoods in it like as broccoli has kale it has pea protein, it's dairy free. So I, I really love that product. Um, so that's, I, I'm gonna do one for food and beverage just okay. to kind of balance it out. Go for it. That, that is a, they're a young company. You know, they're in like Sprouts, they're in Whole Foods, they're in Southern California predominantly, but Bright Bar is an awesome, awesome product. Like it is, it's so clean and like it tastes so good. So that's a good one. Um, on the beverage side, I actually have one here, so I can just pull it. So um, Wild Tonic Kombucha, I actually haven't even opened it yet, but I'm gonna open it. And uh, this stuff is amazing. So this stuff is a kombucha that has honey in it instead of uh, sugar for the fermentation process. And this one's the blackberry mint. And um, I've always loved kombucha and um, I love GT, you know, health aid. But I think the wild tonic really is a differentiator because it's simple ingredients and also it's made with honey, you know, versus made with sugar. And it has this whole other taste profile to it, which is awesome. And so I, I order this on Instacart all the time, you know, and it's also when it came out, it was expensive. It was like $5.99, but now they're at like $3.99. So I can buy it and not worry about the price. So those are my two, Bright Bar, the food side and wild tonic kombucha on the drink side go on instacart now buy it and also yeah, wild, wild tonic team you got to send your uh, endorsement checks to alex at his home we'll, we'll get you the address that was a great uh, great ad for them i'll take products i'm good with that totally yeah. totally totally i've spoken to those guys and i think again it's it's uh, been around a long time uh it's become mainstream uh if you read into some of them some of them aren't so great and they're like you know mostly water or like mass produced and don't have as much functional benefit um and then there's some hero brands that really stand out so i think that's a great endorsement on both fronts uh i'm actually curious i had a question for you about like 
if you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? Meaning like other industry. But I'm curious if, if Genius Juice sold tomorrow, I was going to say if it went out of business, but you know, God forbid, let's say it sold and you had a chance to restart um, and you were going to stay in food and beverage. Is there anything that you would stay away from? Like, would you stay away from refrigerated? Would you stay away from like, would you, or, or, or go into, would you like definitely plant-based? Is there, is there another area in this space that you'd be curious about trying or that you've learned that you would definitely stay away from having done the genius juice journey? The first thing I would go into is wellness shots. So I would go into that. So, um, because it's, it's surging right now because of COVID people are, um, you know, I mean, even, you know, genius juice sales, depending on the, on the store that has gone up, you know, right. depending on where it is in the country, right. With certain States have been affected by COVID, but I think the shot category is continuing to surge and it's not going to stop anytime soon. Big and, week revived this week. Yeah. Yeah. 13 million, right. And their series B and congrats to, to JR and Wyatt. I actually met, JR, even before he started Vive, he was thinking of, he wanted to get into the industry. And I remember getting a call from him one day, you know, I met him through like a trade show or something. And he was just wanting to join and get into a company. And, and so like, I got a call from him one day. He was like, he's like, yeah, I started this company with um, a guy named Wyatt called Vive. And I'm like, Vive? What the hell is Vive? What is Vive? You know? And I'm like, what does that name mean? But I'm like, it's a cool sounding name. No one's ever come up with that name. Alive, live, vibe, it's cool. So I got it right away, the branding, you know, and I think that's what led to their success was, you know, great founding team, but also great branding, simple branding. I think they use Interact, right, for that? I think so. Yeah. So the shot category is, is um, I've been a big, I've taken anti-inflammatory shots for the last four and a half years. Um, mine tastes a lot worse than, <laughs> right. than like Vive or Core. Um, I use uh, apple cider vinegar, black cumin seed oil, um, cold pressed turmeric, and uh, flaxseed oil. It's it's probably the worst. It, it'd be like it'd be it'd be like torturing people if I came out with that shot. It would be right. like it would make people would suffer if they had what I have every morning. But I, I, I'm a big believer in anti-inflammatory and turmeric ginger concentrated shots for functionality and for efficacy so i would love to get into that category you know at some point like i think that'd probably be my next thing because i'm passionate about it i take it every morning and it's also a surgeon category um wellness shots they're great big fan i just took one of the love grace little plug for one of my clients so what is it uh, nice. orange big, ginger big. lemon oregano himalayan sea salt um cold press so the ginger bomb. Um, so it looks, it looks like a like a four ounce, not even a two ounce. How big is that? Yeah, it's pretty big. How big is this thing? Uh, yeah, four and a half fluid ounces. Wow. So that's like between a drink and a shot. That's that's yeah. Like, it's like kind of like got to work your way through it. The oregano and ginger is like real real harsh and strong. Um, but uh, I've been I've been a fan. Um, so uh, what, I'm curious for you, uh, you mentioned Instacart before. Are you an Instacart shopper in general or do you go to retail, not just to look at your product, but like as a consumer? And if you go to a store, like what, what's your store of choice for, for buying food? Um, I actually used Instacart for the first time about three days ago. Okay. And um, I guess some, some feedback, it was frustrating because my products were out. You know, and then so, you know, I mean, it's not Instacart's fault. So aggravating though. You know, and because, you know, I'm, I'm buying products that I'm very niche in what I buy. You know, when I go into like a Vons or a Whole Foods, I'm not buying, I'm not filling, we're millennials, you know, we're not filling up the whole shopping cart, right? We're like buying like four things right. <laughs> and then boom, 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 put it in and then out the door. Um, so I, I, I am, Instacart is great for the technology, keeps people safe. You don't have to go to the stores. But for people like me that are so incredibly picky about what I want, I'm not going to replace what I want with something else, which is what you do on Instacart. If you can't find this, replace it with this. You tell the person to do that in the store. I can't do that. So I, I, enjoy, I enjoy going to stores um, because I get to study consumer habits. I get to see the shelf. I get to see how, you know, like, you know, how Genius is doing. I love to see that. 
Um, but I, I just love the experience of going to a store, even in these times. I mean, I have to wear a mask, you have to social distance, but I, I just like to see options. I like to see the shelf. I like to see what consumers are doing. I also, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of a borderline invasion of privacy, but I look like when I go, when I walk by someone, I'm like, what's in your cart? You know, what are you buying? I look at the person, what kind of person they are. Are they young? Are they older? You know, uh, are they millennial? Are they not? Are they family person? And I see what they have in their cart because that's really where the trend is going. So I like to study consumers because, you know, if we don't understand our consumer, we're never going to have a successful product or brand. You, we're never, we're not going to know what people want. And we're, mm -hmm. we're innovating new, a new line of a coconut smoothie, which is launching in early to mid 2021 might be delayed by a few days, a few days, a few months because of COVID, you know, we're handling things right now and want to stay with that and strengthen that before moving on or before coming out with a new line. But the line was, strongly innovated based on consumer habits and strongly based on what people want out of our product. So um, I could have not achieved that without asking consumers, what do you want? What do you look for? When you see this shelf, right? With that has genius, Koya, rebel, harmless harvest, like why, why are you, what do you buy and why do you buy it? You know, so that, that really, uh, that really um, guided me and navigated me to, creating our next line, right? To supplement and be next to our core line. So more, more, news, to come, more news to come on that. This that was my next question. Any news to come in the next three to six months? You just answered that. So we'll definitely be uh, waiting for more information on that. Um, and uh, before we get off, just where, where can people find you uh, online, on social? So uh, best place, well, on social media, um, on Instagram, um, I know that you're no stranger to our page being our, you know, um, since we were a client of yours, genius underscore juice, um, at genius underscore juice on Instagram. And then on our website, geniusjuice.com. And you can buy the product on there. Um, if you want to find us in the stores, depending on where you are in the country, we're in Whole Foods and SoCal, NorCal, Rockies and, and Northeast. Um, we're in Albertsons Bonds Pavilions. We're in Publix. We're in HEB. We're in Walmart, but not in a ton of stores, mostly in Southern California. Um, yeah, that's where we are. Great. And I'm sure uh, continuously expanding each month. So expanding in the right way. Yeah. yeah. Getting, getting in the right stores where it makes sense for our product to be. So it's, uh, since it's premium, we got to be choosy. And um, if we need to say no to an opportunity, we do, right? If it's not the right store for our product at this time. Yeah, our buddy Mark That's Samuel is big on, big on saying no. Exactly. It's a whole other subject, right? Totally. Like when to say yes, when to say no, right? Totally. That will be uh, episode two. Uh, before we get off, um, is there anyone else that you think would be a good candidate to be on this podcast? Uh, I mentioned his brand earlier. I, I really like uh, Brendan Schaefer <laughs> of Bright Bar. Um, I think he's just an awesome... Uh, have you ever met Brendan? No. Or? Yeah, so he his protein bars, which are like a competitor to like Perfect Bar, refrigerated. Um, I love his products. I love his mission. I've known him since he started, even pre, you know, pre being on shelf. So Brandon at Bright Bar would be awesome. Um, man, I would I would love if you can get him on the show. I, I mentioned Wild Tonic is another one, but um, GT Dave. You know, he's a he's tough, tough guy to nail down. He's, he's a, you know, he's busy. Uh, he's a billionaire. <laughs> yeah, I love this TikTok campaign he just did. Crazy. Yeah, the dancing, right? Yeah, smart. Yeah. Totally. It's genius. Yeah. So I would love for you to get him on the show. It's hard, yeah. but um, maybe if you can pull that off, he has a lot of great things to say and he's very sage and he's been around, you know, he knows this industry so well. Right. And he's a pioneer and, you know, a lot of beverage entrepreneurs look up to him. And anyone, you know, anyone in CPG looks up to him. So yeah, I'd love sure. to have him. get him. Sure. Those are great names. So uh, hopefully your shout out will give them, give me a, you know, a leg up and getting them on here. Um, but, uh, you know, either way, uh, I appreciate your time. This was our episode with Alex Bayer. Uh, keep an eye out for this and definitely keep an eye out for his product. I think you'll be a, a big, big fan. And uh, if you try it and you like it, let us know. Uh, we both love feedback and uh, hopefully my endorsement was a good one because uh, 
uh, you know, I like to put my name out on certain brands and this is one I can definitely give a big thumbs up to. So give it a try. Uh, thanks a lot, Alex. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for having me on.